Today's topic of discussion is endometrial hyperplasia. But before going into detail of that, the normal endometrial thickness is around 8 to 11 millimeters. This is taken as an acceptable range. Now, the risk of endometrial carcinoma is around 7% if the thickness is increased from 11 millimeter. But it is less than 0.002% if the thickness is less than 11 millimeter. As I discussed with you, the normal thickness of or the acceptable range of thickness of endometrium is 11 to 14 millimeter. It is seen in various studies that thickness of endometrium greater than 14 millimeter is associated with atypical endometrial hyperplasia or endometrial hyperplasia or complex endometrial hyperplasia with cytological atypia. Under 14 millimeter thickness, the risk of endometrial hyperplasia is low and below 14 millimeter of thickness, the risk of endometrial carcinoma was found to be 0.06%. Now, dear colleagues, we are going to discuss a topic which is endometrial hyperplasia. Endometrial hyperplasia is important because it is responsible for abnormal endometrial bleeding or intrauterine bleeding. It is defined as proliferation of the endometrial glands relative to stroma, which results in the increased gland to stroma ratio when compared to the normal proliferative endometrium. Now, I explain that once the, there is a proliferative endometrium, there is proliferation of the stroma, there is proliferation of the endometrial glands, the endometrial glands are uh, tubular in shape. But in case of endometrial hyperplasia, the increase is uh, in the favor of glandular proliferation as compared to stroma. The number of glands as compared to the proliferation of the stroma is in the favor of the glands. Endometrial hyperplasia is associated with prolonged estrogen stimulation uh, by the estrogen hormone. Endometrial hyperplasia is associated with prolonged estrogen stimulation of the endometrium, which may be uh, due to exogenous source or endogenous source, but it is associated with and ovulatory cycles. There are many conditions which are associated with endometrial hyperplasia and that include obesity, menopause, polycystic ovarian disease, granulosa cell tumor of the ovary and that granulosa cell tumor of the ovary which is functional. The functional tumor of the ovaries like granulosa cell tumor which produced estrogen hormone. Besides this, there, are, there is excessive cortical function which leads to endometrial hyperplasia. Similarly, prolonged administration of estrogen substances as a part of replacement therapy, they are also responsible for endometrial hyperplasia. The genetic alteration which is commonly found in a significant number of endometrial hyperplasia is inactivation of P10 tumor suppressor gene which is located on Q arm of chromosome number 10. P10 is responsible for encoding a dual specificity uh, phosphatase capable of dysphosphorylating both lipid and protein molecules. But when P10 is inactive, AKT phosphorylation is enhanced which stimulates protein synthesis set proliferation and at the same time inhibits apoptosis. Mutation in P10 is seen in more than 20% of hyperplasia both with or without atypia and in 30 to 80% of the endometrial carcinoma. Gordon syndrome is caused by germline mutation in P10 mutation where high incidence of uh, endometrial carcinoma is recorded. Regarding Gordon syndrome, it is an autosomal dominant inherited condition which is characterized by benign overgrowths 
called hematomas as well as increased lifetime risk of breast thyroid uterine and other organ cancers now coming back to loss of p10 which results in the activation of akt which is also called protein kinase b actively lead to phosphorylation of estrogen receptor in a ligand independent manner which means that the loss of function of p10 function may activate pathways which are normally activated by the estrogens now we'll briefly discuss classification and morphological features of various types of endometrial hyperplasia first simple endometrial hyperplasia without atypia which was also known as cystic or mild endometrial hyperplasia in this conditions the glands are of variable sizes their shapes are irregular and some of these glands show cystic dilatation the epithelial growth pattern and cytological features are similar to those of proliferative endometrium although mitoses are not very prominent such type of endometrial hyperplasia only 1% of them they progress to adenocarcinoma many glands in this condition may undergo cystic atrophy when estrogen stimulation is withdrawn the next type is simple hyperplasia with atypia it is an uncommon type because as far as the structure is concerned the glands are simple that when i say the glands are simple it means they do not show any budding or they do not show any uh, marked variation in size and shape but the, there is cytological atypia within the glandular epithelial cells and when we say cytological atypia it means the nuclear are the nuclei are vesicular the nuclei uh, have prominent nuclei there is they lose their normal arrangement to the basement membrane and there is loss of polarity 8% of such lesions they progress to endometrial carcinoma the other type is complex endometrial hyperplasia without atypia in this condition there is increase in the number and size of endometrial glands marked gland crowding so that the glands are lying back to back against each other the glands show a branching pattern with the result there is a very little intervening stroma and there are also abundant mitotic figures these glands remain distinct non confluent and their lining epithelium remain uh, cytologically normal this class of lesions they progress to endometrial carcinoma in 3% of cases and the incidence is lower than simple hyperplasia with atypia now one thing you must appreciate that it is the cytological atypia which is more important rather than the architectural pattern of the glands the architectural pattern of the gland is also important the other type is complex endometrial hyperplasia with atypia when i say that complex endometrial hyperplasia it means the glands are increased in number and their lining epithelial show atypical changes sometimes it is very difficult to differentiate with well differentiated endometrioid carcinoma with the result the accurate distinction between complex endometrial hyperplasia with atypia and adenocarcinoma of the endometrium may be possible only on hysterectomy specimen there is a study in which females with complex endometrial hyperplasia with atypia were treated with progestin therapy alone 50% had persistent disease 25% reoccurred and 25% progressed to carcinoma complex hyperplasia with atypia is managed with hysterectomy or in young women a trial of progestin therapy is given and with a close follow up now in the photograph uh, you can well see that the endometrial glands uh, with simple hyperplasia and without any uh, cytological atypia the dilatation is more and it's almost cystically dilated gland now the next photograph uh, 
you can well appreciate that it is a complex hyperplasia. Complex hyperplasia means there is crowding of the glands, the glands they have show uh, variation in shape and there is budding coming out of these glands and uh, but there is no atypia which is shown here. Then the this photograph shows that the glands are complex and there is complex hyperplasia they are uh, lying back to back against each other with very little stroma in between them and there is uh, presence of atypia 